Good morning. Uh, I'm Tristan Volpe, and on behalf of the Center for Global Security Research, uh, let me welcome you back to the Nuclear Crossroads Speaker Series, which has been ongoing for about a year now. So I usually begin these sort of introductions uh, with an overview of the speaker's accomplishments, uh, which in Vipin's case are, are many. But this morning, I'm going to cut uh, to uh, a critical take-home point, which is if you want to better understand the challenges of the post-Cold War second nuclear age we are living in today, then I strongly urge you to read his 2014 book, Nuclear Strategy uh, in the Modern Era. <laughs> yes, Vibin has the accomplishment, uh, a political scientist publishing a book last year, and it, and it has already sold out on Amazon, but it is now restocked. Um, yeah, in this book, uh, Vipin unpacks the very different types of deterrent strategies, or what he calls nuclear postures, that regional powers, such as Pakistan, China, South Africa, uh, have adopted. Uh, and it advances a convincing framework to explain why and when regional powers will select one strategy over others. But perhaps most importantly, Vipin marshals a, 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 a wide range of evidence to show that the mere possession of nuclear weapons does not automatically generate a, a uniform deterrent effect. In his words, quote, some nuclear postures deter conflict much more successfully than others. And as we'll hear in this morning's seminar, which draws from this recent uh, publication, this finding has some profound and frightening implications for the future of strategic stability, especially in troubled regions. So this seminar will uh, run for about 45 minutes, after which we'll host our normal uh, unclassified question and answer session. And with that, let me welcome Professor Narang to the stage. Thanks. Thank you, Tristan, and uh, to the lab for hosting me. It's a real pleasure to be out here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I grew up and uh, I was actually born only 20 miles from here and grew up in the Bay Area, so it's always fun to come back. Uh, Boston is still melting off the snow, so uh, I never miss an opportunity to come back. Uh, so thank you for hosting me. Um, so as Tristan mentioned, today I'm going to talk about uh, my book, which was released last year by Princeton University Press, Nuclear Strategy in the Modern Era, uh, Regional Powers and International Conflict. Uh, and it arose um, from my doctoral work uh, and the observation that regional powers have thought about nuclear strategy and postures differently from each other and differently from the superpowers. And so there's a huge gap in the political science uh, and strategic literature on how regional powers thought about nuclear strategy and posture, and then what effect those choices had on their ability to deter conflict. So that was the basic motivation uh, for, the, for the project. Uh, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the framework, the different strategies that the regional powers have adopted, and then I'm going to focus in on Asia. So I'm going to talk uh, in detail about Chinese, Indian, and Pakistani nuclear strategy and posture, um, and then open it up to question and answer, and hopefully we can you know, throw it open to any uh, issues or concerns, questions you guys might have. So first I'm going to talk about the typology of nuclear strategies I identify in regional powers. Um, you know, it's challenging when you're thinking about organizing uh, the strategies of six countries to, uh, you want to avoid the temptation to, you know, bin each country into separate strategies. So uh, how do we organize in an analytically coherent way uh, the different types of strategies available to and chosen by the regional power? So I'll go through that. I'll briefly talk about the theory I developed for why regional powers select the specific strategy that they do. And then I'll close with a discussion of China, India, and Pakistan briefly. So first, what are the nuclear strategies of regional powers? And what are the different options available to them? The conventional wisdom suffers from two major problems. The first is what I call the Cold War hangover. Most of the work on nuclear strategy and at least American strategic and political science thinking, has focused on the nuclear strategies and postures of the superpowers, naturally. Um, and so you know, all of the work on the evolution, if there was any, between flexible response, massive retaliation, damage limitation, and the massive superpower architectures that both the US and the Soviet Union developed dominates our thinking of nuclear strategy. These maximalist uh, postures with their array of capabilities 
really limits our ability to understand the strategies of the regional powers who don't have the resources to develop the kinds of capabilities that the United States and the Soviet Union did, are faced with international constraints like the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, that limit their ability to develop the diverse architecture that the US and Soviet Union did, and often face domestic political problems that the US never faced in terms of command and control, civil military relations, uh, regional security environments that look very different from the US and Soviet Union. And so the, the Cold War hangover, as I describe it in the book, really hampered the academy's ability in particular to think about the types of strategies available to the regional powers who have to, as I, as I say, allocate scarcer deterrent power towards their national security objectives in ways that the US and Soviet Union uh, didn't have to think about as carefully given the resource constraints that the regional powers face. The second problem, relatedly, is kind of the development in American strategic and political science thinking about the so-called existential bias, right? The, the way political science frames U.S. nuclear posture uh, is it was overkill, right? That uh, the, the U.S., it was bureaucratic problems and bureaucratic interests, the, the military-industrial complex that led to uh, an architecture that far exceeded the U.S.'s re requirements to deter conflict. And this led the academy to believe that there was actually uh, an existential effect of nuclear weapons, basic nuclear weapons capabilities to deter conflict. And the problem wasn't explaining why the U.S. might have thought about it needed this diverse array uh, of nuclear uh, capabilities and damage lim limitation capabilities, because just a simple nuclear weapons capability ought to be sufficient to deter not only nuclear conflict, but also conventional conflict. And this was the bias that developed in the academic literature. It led to the huge concern about proliferation, right? If, nuclear, if a single nuclear weapon or a few nuclear weapons could deter nuclear and conventional conflict, then regional proliferation was a real problem for the United States, right? If North Korea had just a couple nuclear weapons and could deter American freedom of action, then uh, obviously this was a big policy problem. But this existential bias, as I call it, really arose uh, you know, towards the, the, the latter parts of the, Cold, of the Cold War in the academic literature. Uh, and the argument was that the mere possession of a few nuclear weapons was sufficient to deter uh, conflict. Uh, and so my study takes these two uh, threads in the academic literature uh, and uh, focuses on the regional powers, classifies their different strategies, uh, and argues and shows uh, that the so-called existential bias that pervades the academic literature is in fact empirically false at the regional levels. That states require a lot more sometimes than just a mere possession of a few nuclear weapons to deter particularly conventional conflict. Uh, and uh, that's why we see uh, sometimes the diversity of nuclear strategies at the regional level. So uh, when we're studying regional power nuclear strategy, the two questions that I focus on are what is a set of strategies available, and why do states adopt one over the other? Uh, the second half of the book, which I'm not going to focus on as much today, uh, is the effects on deterrence outcomes. Just a preview of that. Um, I think the findings uh, show that uh, states that select the more aggressive nuclear strategies that I identify have greater success at deterring conventional conflict. Uh, and this overturns at least the academic conventional wisdom about the existential bias and effect of nuclear weapons. And I think that's really important uh, you know, in, the, in, in the political science literature to question what it takes to deter uh, with nuclear weapons. And I think the, the academy had settled on one answer. And I think uh, the, the findings of this book suggest that we need to reopen that debate. And particularly at the regional level, it takes a lot more to deter than the academy uh, believed was necessary. So, the three nuclear strategies that I identify are on a spectrum of capabilities and command and control uh, architectures. The first is what I call a catalytic strategy. Now, this is distinct from the Cold War terminology of catalytic nuclear war, where a third party would try to induce conflict between the US and Soviet and start a war. This is a strategy uh, where a state with limited forces ambiguous forces, can manipulate the threat of breakout to compel the United States to intervene on its behalf in a conventional conflict, right? So it was the, the aim of the posture and strategy is to catalyze 
particularly American intervention on the state's behalf uh, in order to defend it against uh, potential adversaries. So this is about third party compellence. It's using the threat of breakout, which the United States, for a variety of reasons, uh, opposed uh, to compel the United States to intervene on the state's behalf so that the state wouldn't cross certain red lines in its nuclear program. Right? And so the quintessential examples in the, uh, in the book are Israel, the 1973 war, uh, using the threat of breakout to catalyze U.S. intervention on its behalf, Pakistan in the 1980s, using uh, the threat to cross certain pre-agreed upon red lines in its nuclear program to compel the U.S. to intervene in crises with India, uh, and then South Africa, which had an explicit catalytic strategy in the 1980s. Uh, Prime Minister Bota explicitly said, you know, if we pop this thing off, the Yanks will come running. Um, and the idea was to use, you know, South, South Africa had a, had a stuttered uranium enrichment program. They had, by the end of the program, six and a half weapons cores. Uh, it's, it's believed, uh, believed to have six and a half uh, uranium weapons cores. And uh, the idea was, what do you do with such a limited arsenal? Well, you could test one, you could threaten, you know, break out, uh, and the, really, the only real effect is to convince the United States that uh, you, know, you, you, you perceive a threat and the United States should intervene on your behalf to uh, ameliorate the threat so you don't um, go further in, the, in your nuclear program. So that's the catalytic strategy. The second strategy, which will be familiar to, uh, to most of you, is the, what I call the assured retaliation strategy. This is your basic development of a secure second strike force. Uh, and it's not, I use the term assured retaliation very carefully. It's not assured destruction, and it's not massive retaliation, although both are theoretically plausible within an assured retaliation framework. But a basic assured retaliation capability where a state has believed, believably survivable second strike forces to be able to retaliate in kind if it faces you know, some level of unspecified uh, destruction. Uh, and this is really a deterrence by punishment strategy. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the regional level, when you're facing adversaries with limited counterforce capabilities, an assured retaliation strategy is not as difficult necessarily to implement uh, because forces tend to be more survivable if your adversaries don't have the ability to find, fix, uh, and destroy them. Uh, but the aim here is simply to be able to retaliate with uh, nuclear forces if necessary and directly deter adversaries. And usually these are states that are trying to deter strictly nuclear use or coercion against it, right? There's no envisioned employment mode against conventional forces and deterrence by denial missions, uh, but primarily in uh, deterrence by punishment mission. The final strategy is probably the most aggressive. You call it the first use strategy. I call it asymmetric escalation to, uh, to, to get out of the Cold War lexicon that, and vocabulary that constrained our thinking, I think, about regional power nuclear strategy. But the idea here is to asymmetrically escalate a conventional conflict to a nuclear conflict by threatening first use of nuclear forces on conventional capabilities. Now, you can think about the kind of states that may want to adopt this strategy. If you're facing a conventionally superior neighbor that can use ground power against you, uh, it makes rational sense to threaten first use against uh, those forces in a deterrence by denial mission, either concentrated uh, armored or mechanized forces, bridgeheads, whatever the case may be, to deny and then threaten further escalation uh, with, with nuclear weapons. And the states that adopt this uh, currently are Pakistan and France um, at the regional level. Both uh, have explicit first use doctrines and postures uh, and make them credible by developing tactical nuclear weapons, command and control structures that credibly threaten to adversaries that they might be able to use nuclear weapons first in a conventional conflict. So those are the three basic strategies I identify. And the, the challenge with any typology is, you know, is it mutually exclusive and exhaustive? I think it's exhaustive empirically. And I do think that these strategies are mutually exclusive. And I code a state by what it's maximally capable of doing, right? So a state that has uh, an asymmetric escalation posture may ha also have assured retaliation capabilities. But if you think of these as a concentric circles, for example, uh, I code a state by the outermost uh, strategy that uh, it, it can possibly uh, employ. So here's my theory of just a, a depiction, a decision tree of why states might adopt one strategy over the other. 
And there's a set of sequential variables prioritized by a state security environment. Uh, and you know, if you start with a regional nuclear power, a state that already has nuclear weapons, let's just take it as given that a, state, a regional state has nuclear weapons. The first question the state asks itself is, do I have a reliable third party patron? In the Cold War, this was often the United States. Now I think with North Korea, North Korea may think that China is its patron state. right? So do I have a reliable third party patron that I can count on to intervene on my behalf in a conflict uh, such that I don't have to face the cost of overt breakout. Right? So it's optimal for me to think about a catalytic strategy if I can use the threat and manipulate the threat of breakout to compel a third party to intervene on my behalf and avoid the cost of explicit breakout by doing so. This can be optimal if I have a reliable third party patron state that I can rely on. If so, then a catalytic strategy makes a lot of sense. If not, then the next question is, well, do I have a conventionally superior proximate existential threat or offensive threat to me that demands an asymmetric escalation posture? If so, I have no choice but to adopt an asymmetric escalation posture. Right? So Pakistan finds itself now in the second branch point. It faces a conventionally superior proximate offensive threat in India. It can no longer, well, you know, after 1990 or so, Pakistan decided it could no longer rely on America and the United States to intervene on its behalf in a conflict with India. In fact, the United States started intervening on India's behalf thereafter. Uh, so it has no choice but to adopt an asymmetric escalation posture. The security environment is so constraining uh, that uh, it has to adopt a first use posture to deter the conventionally superior power on its, neighbor, uh, on its borders. If the answer to that question is no, then the state finds itself in a more permissive security environment. It doesn't have to use nuclear weapons to deter conventional power. Right? So uh, then the latitude that states have to choose between an assured retaliation or an asymmetric escalation posture depends on its civil military arrangements. So do I want to delegate command and control authority and assets to my military? Right, so in the Chinese case, party military relations are assertive enough that the Chinese state at this point has decided to essentially adopt an assured retaliation strategy because of its civil military relations. I also code India in this category because of its what I call pathological civil military relations. The civilian leadership in India uh, has no desire to include the military into its decision-making loop and certainly devol de devolution of nuclear assets to the military. And so it adopts an assured retaliation strategy. Neither face conventionally existential threats on their borders uh, and uh, have the latitude to adopt an assured retaliation strategy uh, and do so be primarily because of civil military relations. And this is important because it identifies a potential driver of change. And I'll talk about this more in both cases. But in these cases, it's not the security environment that dictates its strategy, but civil military relations, right? So this gives us the ability to observe a particular, particular evolution in civil military or party military relations in India and China to see if India and China revise those structures and put themselves in a position to adopt an asymmetric escalation posture, then that's something that we can observe and adjust policies accordingly. States that have delegative structures like uh, France uh, and Israel then have to ask themselves, can I afford an asymmetric escalation strategy? It might be more expensive. The array of uh, capabilities and command and control pressure that an asymmetric escalation posture puts on a state may be more resource intensive. So if I don't have resource constraints vis-a-vis -vis my primary adversary, then an asymmetric escalation strategy actually makes a lot of sense. right? So these are states that have the luxury of a permissive security environment stable civil military relations, and the resources to be able to adopt it. Right? So I say the asymmetric escalation posture is the curse of the severely threatened and the luxury of the rich and stable. Right? So it's no surprise that you might find France. And uh, I predict that Israel should adopt an asymmetric escalation strategy. But when I go through the cases, this is actually a, 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 the lone misprediction of the theory. The capabilities, as far as we know publicly, that Israel has uh, uh, developed actually suggests that Israel finds itself more in an assured retaliation strategy by moving to the Dolphin class uh, submarines uh, and 
uh, the lack of indicators of tactical nuclear weapons and missions for first use in, in a conventional conflict. Even though the theory would predict that that's precisely what Israel should adopt if it, if it had nuclear weapons, uh, it, it, I, I claim and concede that the Israeli case is very difficult because of the lack of publicly available information to code accurately. So this is a prediction, uh, even though the data suggests that Israel might actually be over in the assured retaliation box. So this is a general theory for what might push states towards one strategy or another, and importantly, why they might change strategies. Right? So knowing, knowing these variables and their coding suggests that if a variable shifts at a higher node level, you might get a change in posture. And so that's why I thought it was important to develop a theory for why states might select the strategy. So as we're observing regional power nuclear strategies, you know, not only do we want to know what they have now, but what might cause them to shift in the future. So how does this work in Asia? I think the most dynamic uh, nuclear developments at the moment are in Asia. And you have particularly, so leaving Iran and Israel aside, Pakistan, India, and China, three bordering states, all with nuclear capabilities. Uh, China with a more mature nuclear structure and nuclear strategy. South Asia, India, and Pakistan having, uh, well, we're now uh, 17 years almost exactly 17 years from uh, the May 1998 test. And uh, the, uh, they're still in the maturation phase of their nuclear strategies and consolidation of their nuclear forces. So there's a lot of dynamism in Asia. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that today. So China, uh, it's a DF-31. Um, the prediction is that China would have an assured retaliation strategy. You know, and this is primarily because of its permissive land security environment. Uh, it has manpower advantages now against Russia in the Far East. Uh, Russia's, you know, the trend lines and conventional forces are such that uh, China doesn't necessarily face a significant conventional threat as it did in the 1960s from the Soviet Union. Um, so it has a permissive land security environment where using nuclear weapons first against ground forces, either Indian or Russian, isn't really necessary. So in the Chinese case, it's primarily party military, uh, party military relations and the preference for assertive control over nuclear assets that led China to develop a dedicated second artillery, uh, demated forces, um, and, and centralized and assertive CMC control over Chinese nuclear assets. And so the, the permissiveness of the security environment at land, right? Now, it's, it's arguable whether developments in the maritime security domain could push China towards thinking about nuclear first use against maritime assets. Uh, my, my theory would suggest that China wouldn't view that as a sensible mission for nuclear weapons. And so you see the development of conventional ballistic missiles for that mission, and nuclear weapons primarily still in, uh, uh, you know, for retaliatory pur purposes. And what we see primarily aligns with an assured retaliation strategy in China. And I think this will persist in the, in the future so long as the preference for assertive uh, command and control uh, remains. Uh, and what we see is that China has a small, uh, maybe less plausibly survivable now than uh, in the past, but effective uh, retaliatory capability against now the United States. Um, it has to deal with um, U.S. Counterforce, uh, conventional counterforce capabilities and uh, the possibility that U.S. missile defenses uh, might be able to intercept remaining forces if there were uh, an attempted counterforce strike. Uh, and so China has had to think very hard about survivability more recently. Uh, and so you see the moves towards mobility, modernization, solid fuel missiles that are mobile, concealment, uh, the SSBN program, uh, which uh, I think the Chinese have internalized, will be a while before, if it's ever survivable against American ASW. But uh, the, the Chinese have had a long-standing view that it takes less capabilities to survive and plausibly deter uh, nuclear use than I think other states. Right. So the China, China's very different from the U.S. and the Soviet Union in terms of what they believed is enough to deter, uh, to deter nuclear use and coercion against it. The Chinese have always had a view that smaller, smaller forces are still sufficient to deter. Now, it's not existential. It's not just a few. But the Chinese believe that plausible retaliation is sufficient to deter. Um, and 
the levels of assurance of that retaliation don't need to be as high as, say, uh, the United States or the Soviet Union believed were necessary. So when we see that, when I look at the developments in Chinese capabilities, uh, in the open source literature at least, the, most of the moves and developments are consistent with trying to make the force survivable against better American counterforce capabilities and damage limitation capabilities. But we don't see, what's important is what we also don't see them developing, right? We don't have much evidence that there are tactical nuclear weapons that are integrated with the, uh, with the PLA. Command and control architecture is still highly centralized. And so delegation of tactical nuclear forces into the second artillery <coughs> that would enable an asymmetric escalation or first use posture does not seem to uh, have, uh, have uh, occurred yet. So what are the drivers of change potentially in the Chinese nuclear strategy? Well, first, it's largely immune to the Asian nuclear balance. Even if Japan were to develop overt nuclear capabilities, or if India were to develop uh, a larger array of China-specific capabilities, it's unlikely that China would adjust its strategy in response. It doesn't need to, right? I mean, it's buffered by, you know, uh, by water against Japan. It does, still doesn't face a, a land conventional threat. Uh, the deterrence requirements do change as American ballistic missile defense and conventional counterforce capabilities improve. China will need more and more mobile systems to be able to uh, survive a potential conventional counterforce strike and then uh, you know, whatever the uh, ballistic missile defense system would be able to intercept. Uh, and you see moves towards Merving and uh, all of the things that we would uh, expect to see if you're faced with a potential counterforce, uh, uh, a serious counterforce capability. Um, one, one area where you might see a shift in overt strategy is, is if uh, the, the status of Taiwan becomes central to the, um, to the U.S.-China conflict. So China views Taiwan as part of the Chinese homeland. And if it were to face uh, a significant threat of, say, American invasion of Taiwan, that could be viewed as a homeland threat that might cause China to start thinking about asymmetric escalation strategies. So uh, it is, it's plausible that as the, as the U.S.-China maritime competition unfolds, uh, if defending Taiwan requires a shift to a strategy of, you know, that, uh, in, that entails the first use of nuclear weapons, that might be one major driver of change where it views itself in a severe security environment and has to maintain the integrity of the homeland, including uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, from, from adversaries in the region. What about India? Here's a, an Agni-3. Um, India is in the midst of a a significant missile modernization development program. Um, so India also, like China, I mean, I think one of the things that came out of the, the book was India and China have very similar nuclear strategies for very similar reasons. Uh, and you know, I think that also uh, was, was an, interesting, an interesting finding. And so uh, India, too, has permissive security environment, conventional superior against Pakistan, uh, conventional deterrent against China in an in inhospitable border certainly doesn't face an existential threat from China in the Northeast or on its eastern borders. Uh, and it has very, very pathological civil military relations. For coup proofing reasons in the 1950s, there's a new book by Stephen Wilkinson, Arming the Nation, which details some of the coup proofing techniques that Nehru in, uh, introduced and that have persisted in India. It keeps the military boxed out of most strategic decision making and certainly nuclear. And so you have very assertive civil military relations, uh, both on the conventional and the nuclear side. And so on the nuclear side, there wasn't even, I mean, the, there's an apocryphal story that the defense minister didn't even know about the nuclear test until he heard about it at the news uh, in 1998. And uh, it, took, it took five years after the nuclear test for India to develop a professional strategic force command. For a modern nuclear state, it's remarkable how little and how poorly integrated the military has been, the end users have been in the Indian system. It's been primarily controlled by civilians and scientists. So what does India look like? That's a prediction. Uh, it's, I still classify it as an assured retaliation strategy. And it is at heart a retaliatory uh, posture and uh, doctrine. There are some interesting changes going on in the Indian system. And I've started writing a little bit more about this uh, recently. Um, 
there's a view from 2000, 2001. There's a, a great book, which was an inspiration partly for my work uh, on, on nuclear posture by Ashley Tellis, India's Emerging Nuclear Posture, which detailed a highly recessed force in being or uh, you know, a, a, a demated and dispersed uh, and unassembled nuclear force. Uh, and like all nuclear powers, India has gone through a maturation process where the, the readiness levels of certain forces have improved over time. Uh, and India does not necessarily maintain all of its forces in uh, disassembled or demated state. Some subset of the forces, the higher states of readiness, what state exactly isn't known in the private, in, in the open source. Um, we know that there's still highly assertive control exercised uh, over the force through the national security advisor, who's the point person for the, S, for the strategic force command and the scientists. So moving up alert levels requires inputs from the national security advisor who resides in the prime minister's office. Um, we see India uh, developing an SSBN program uh, at tremendous cost and command and control headache and how they work out assertive command and control over the SSBN force yet remains to be seen. But we also see a variety of capabilities being developed under the very Indian term technology demonstrators. And it's unclear whether India is going to adopt these in its nuclear force posture, but you see India developing MIRVs for the Agni-5, which is a China-specific capability. Um, you see uh, canisterization of certain capabilities differently than I think China and the Soviet Union and Russia did it uh, so under, under SEAL. And what that means for when and how the warhead would be mated with the system. Uh, is unclear, and that may have implications for command and control. We see the development of damage limitation, limitation capabilities, limited, but nevertheless, uh, you know, some interest in missile defense systems for uh, Delhi and Bombay. Lower order use options. And these could all be consistent. I think they all are consistent with, you know, retaliatory mode, particularly, you know, merving your longer range missiles against China makes sense if you think, you know, you're worried about survivability of missiles, warheads are cheaper than missiles, you're not going to develop and build a lot of Agni 5s. You may want to MIRV, MIRV them so that whatever may survive first use against you would have greater retaliatory throw weight. Uh, but if you're Pakistan, you have to start worrying about what those MIRVs mean for you. And you know, there are ways, about, depending on where you deploy and launch Agni 5, how you adjust the trajectory. Uh, if you're Pakistan, the combination of MIRVs and ballistic missile defense can start looking uh, a little more like counterforce. Uh, and, you know, if India were to walk away from its no first use pledge, you know, and you're Pakistan, you see these developments and you start worrying about what that means for your survivability. And so the dynamism uh, in, in Asia kind of turns on India's developments and how Pakistan reacts to them on this side, right? It's India's conventional capabilities that Pakistan's trying to deter. So India's conventional doctrine uh, puts, you know, uh, Pakistan and, you know, in, gives it, um, you know, makes it apoplectic. And then you see, if you see these nuclear developments, developments you also start worrying about what you, wh what you have to build up and build out uh, to be able to survive a potential Indian, um, uh, Indian first use if they would ever walk away from a first use posture and doctrine, which Pakistan doesn't believe exists anyway. Um, and so these are things to watch in the Indian system. I mean, I think they're all consistent with assured retaliation, but there's been a lot of reticence in the Indian system about what these capabilities mean and what they're going to be deployed and used for. Uh, a little more transparency, I think, would help. Uh, you know, the old strange old line, what's the point of a doomsday machine if nobody knows about it? If you're developing MIRVs and, you know, BMD for counterforce, you know, there's a certain amount of transparency uh, toward it. Or, or if you're only developing for, for retaliatory capability, reassurance is a big piece of, of, of uh, nuclear strategy as well. And if India is really developing these for, uh, you know, use against uh, against China, some reassurance to Pakistan would help, uh, I think, alleviate some of the concerns that the Pakistanis have. So, you know, India is going through a maturation phase and there's modernization and technology development there that I think warrants observation, uh, but I still classify it as uh, a primarily and, and certainly assured retaliation uh, strategy. So the drivers of change in the Indian case to watch are a reorientation of the civil military relations. We have a new government in India, the Modi government, which um, may be more amenable to revisions in civil military structures and bringing the military uh, deeper into, this, into the decision-making cycle. That might enable India to move to uh, away from assured retaliation 
if civil military relations become less pathological in India, then India finds itself in a position where it has a luxury to choose between you know, a more aggressive asymmetric escalation strategy or assured retaliation. And so watching this as it unfolds may be, uh, uh, would, it will be important. Um, I do think there should be and may be adjustments to the retaliatory strategy that India has now. They now threaten massive retaliation against Pakistan. It's, it's in the, 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 the phrase in the doctrine, uh, the official release of the doctrine in 2003 refers explicitly to uh, massive punitive retaliation, which the Pakistanis, in the contingency in which Pakistan might use nuclear weapons, which is uh, tactical first use or battlefield first use on Indian conventional forces, the Pakistanis don't believe is particularly credible. And so how do you signal to Pakistani that you've also developed a range of lower order use options that could be used against uh, non-counter value targets as well? And I think India is thinking through that uh, at the moment. So there might be some adjustments to the type of retaliation uh, that India uh, threatens. Uh, but if you observe the capabilities, India is putting itself in a position where it can have graduated retaliation or graded uh, retaliation, not just massive retaliation. So finally, um, probably the most interesting uh, and scary state to, uh, in, the, in the system right now, uh, Pakistan, uh, which I think today again tested a Gori missile um, after last week test, or a couple weeks ago testing a Shaheen 3, which is a, a interesting development. The, the Pakistanis are, you know, develop a, a whole class of, a whole new class of missile to hold, uh, you know, General Kidwai said the Andaman and Nicobar Islands at risk because they worry about the Strategic Force Command installations at Andaman and Nicobar Islands. But to develop a whole new class of missile to hold, you know, the Indian islands of Andaman and Nicobar at risk, you know, suggests that, you know, Pakistan is really diversifying its portfolio of you know, full spectrum deterrence capabilities from the Nasser, which is the you know, battlefield nuclear capability, the cruise missiles, uh, all the way up to now 2750 kilometer Shaheen 3 missile. Uh, so Pakistan is, is, is developing a whole range of use options. Um, and uh, it empirically has adopted the other two strategies. So in the 1980s, it had a catalytic strategy when the U.S. was really concerned that Pakistan was going to, you know, the Pressler Amendment in the, in the 1980s actually clearly defined where Pakistan could go and no further, right? So it, it clearly specified that Pakistan could not have an assembled weapon. And so uh, to avoid triggering congressional legislation, uh, you know, Pakistan knew that it could manipulate that definition to compel the U.S. to intervene in particular crises. So in the brass tax crisis in 86, the Kashmir crisis in 1990, you see evidence that the U.S. is really concerned about Pakistan crossing certain red lines. And Pakistan exploited that uh, to compel U.S. intervention. When the first Afghan war ended, Pakistan you know, decided it couldn't rely on U.S. Uh, intervention on its behalf anymore. And when it tested in 1998, moved explicitly to a first use asymmetric escalation strategy, which, you know, as I've discussed before, is really driven by Indian conventional superiority over Pakistan. The current strategy explicitly aligns with that. I mean, they're very, Pakistan is very, very clear about the fact that it does not abjure first use of nuclear weapons. It's taken time, but it has developed a whole range of lower order use options, the Hadaf 9 Nasser, the cruise missiles, Babur and Rod. Uh, there are a lot of concerns about what command and control during peacetime crisis and war looks like. At what point will the, uh, will, the, will the Nasser be fielded in a conventional conflict? At what point would uh, you know, release authority be granted to uh, whoever is in possession of the Nasser batteries? Um, you see vertical, uh, sorry, vertical proliferation in numbers. Uh, Pakistan trying to develop now survivable second strike forces to be able to deter Indian retaliation against their first use against Indian conventional forces. So Pakistan is now thinking, I think, about how do we main establish and maintain escalation dominance with our first use asymmetric escalation strategy against India, where we, you know, Pakistan is afraid of Indian conventional retaliation, uh, retaliation following what India might perceive as a prov provocation sponsored by Pakistan. Pakistan would use tactical nuclear weapons once their conventional forces broke down, if they broke down, uh, and to deter Indian retaliation of any sort, Pakistan is now developing a whole range of higher class retaliatory options to maintain uh, escalation dominance. And so this is where Pakistan is going. And you think, of, you know, we worry about 
you know, safety, security, and command and control in Pakistan given the internal security threats it faces. And in a crisis, to maintain the credibility of first use, they have to convince the Indians that you know, there's a madman uh, mechanism and a rational mechanism to threaten first use against Indian forces. And at some point, they would have to delegate use authority and the, and the Nasser itself uh, to you know, battlefield or brigadiers, battlefield commanders or brigadiers. And you know, how Pakistan main, would, might maintain command and control of uh, these assets in, in that kind of conflict is, uh, is, a, is a real concern. So the future trend line for Pakistan, though, looks really bad. Right? It's relying much more heavily on nuclear to offset a yawning conventional imbalance against India. And what they believe are Indian uh, conventional doctrinal evolution to uh, more credibly use conventional power to retaliate against Pakistan. And so this reliance is only going to, I think, ha you know, increase in the future as the conventional imbalance grows in India's favor. Uh, and so this starts looking pretty bad when you think about a state that fears for you know, its existence and has to rely on nuclear weapons to preserve itself and faces a, you know, a, a conventionally superior uh, growing neighbor in India. It also has to respond to you know, it belie what it believes are this DRDO wish list of you know, MIRVs and BMDs, which looks like counterforce against their, their uh, strategic capabilities. And so all of this suggests that Pakistan is going to keep building up and building out in terms of capabilities. Uh, and I think that's a real concern for when we think about the safety and security of the arsenal and managing a larger Pakistani arsenal uh, with more capabilities, diverse capabilities, and more hands on the arsenal. So the implication, implication I'll close with this, are you know, we see a diversity of strategies at the regional level. This isn't your Cold War US-Soviet model operating at the regional level. Um, I think the good news is that India, Indian and Chinese nuclear strategies are uncoupled from each other. There really isn't a mechanism for nuclear escalation in India-China conflict. So we'll worry less about that. But we really worry about the coupling of Pakistani nuclear strategy to Indian conventional and nuclear developments. And that's only going to get worse in the future. So OK, I'll stop there. And uh, I look forward to uh, comments, questions. Anything you have? Yes, sir. Sure. Um, yeah, I read your book, or parts of it. Oh, oh, very good. Uh, and some of it reflected what we heard from General uh, Perot's Khan about three weeks ago. Uh -huh. I won't, I won't saddle him with responsibility for making these statements. Walking out of the room, I uh, got the impression there's there. Oh, oh, here's one thing I didn't quite catch in your book or in, or, or or in your talk: the uh, <clears throat> the lack of robust coherence in Pakistani government and command and control actually has the effect of of reducing. The, the effectiveness of its deterrence. Uh, so, but let me finish my question, okay. and that is that, and you do say, it takes you to the last page of your book, thank you, <laughs> but you do say, gee, it might be a good idea for other countries to take steps to uh, help certain countries in, um, in, uh, in, in, in negative control, yes. all right, and security environment. So what comes out of this, and from General Khan's statement is, uh, number one, are there examples you can cite for that? And if we, somebody here in this room, was talking about developing a program to assist countries that we worry about, it really was intriguing that <clears throat> maybe such a program could have sort of dual goals, dual uh, interrelated goals, and that would help sell the program and then make it more acceptable. That's deterrence. Right. And uh, counterterrorism, nuclear security, both concerns. Frankly, sitting here on this continent, I'm more worried about the counterterrorism thing. But of course, we're all worried, all good global citizens. And we worry about the, the deterrence. So uh, can you name examples, or have, have you thought through the mechanics of a joint grand program helping one or maybe two countries on this, on this two-front question? Uh, you know, your deterrence really could be more effective if da 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 yeah. And there are some concerns. General Khan talked about, uh, in maybe guarded, maybe not so guarded terms, the, the risks of, how shall I word it, um, dramatic government disruption in Pakistan at either national or regional level, either of which should keep us all awake at night. So what about examples of or a joint yeah. program of these two uses? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the first point about um, 
the the lack of robustness of command and control in Pakistan reducing deterrence. Yeah. I actually I think that uh, they have calculated, and I think there's probably some basis in this rationale that it it actually enhances deterrence by creating a madman mechanism, yeah. right? So the they have convinced the Indians that you know our command and control. If you start hitting our command and control nodes, our brigadiers are going to have access, you know, and our negative controls are weak enough that they can jury rig them, and when push comes to shove. Right, and uh, Feroz has written about this that when push comes to shove, the emphasis in Pakistan is going to shift to positive, not negative control. And so the lack of robustness may actually be by design. So you convince the Indians, don't degrade our command and control. And in a, in a crisis or conflict, you don't know what, what might happen. And that actually, I think, enhances deterrence um, in, for, from the Pakistani side. The second question is more difficult, right? Because I think in Pakistan in particular, I think they're worried about two things, right? One is, there's the standard Indian conventional threat. I think they worry about so-called render safe options. Right? I think they're really worried about survivability from the US. They saw Abbottabad, and the, the, um, the worry in Pakistan has to be, and they've, you know, it, it's repeatedly been stated, that you know, the, the United States could neutralize Pakistan's nuclear assets. If they could do a bada bada, why can't? How you know? Maybe they can do it to our nuclear assets, right? And so that led, I think, to there was a, there are two possible ways to manage a nuclear force if you're worried about render safe options. One is, you know, there were those reports in the Atlantic by the Atlantic Monthly by I think it was Jeff Goldberg, right, about how Pakistan moves everything around, right, and that shell game, uh, you know, enables enables them to, uh, you know, makes it very difficult for the U.S. They believe to. Uh, find, fix, and seize. That's one option. It's very risky. The other option, which is, which is what President Musharraf talked about, is you centrally control everything in very deep, in very deep and secure tunnel networks, bunkers. Right? So we have these two models out there, and we don't know, I mean, at least in the public source, I'm sure people do know. Uh, in, the, in the open source, we don't know what Pakistan does. Right? But I think building up has a, a virtue of generating enough uncertainty about how many nuclear assets you might have that a render safe option is is deterrable simply by the uncertainty that it might be successful, right? So um, whichever model Pakistan chooses to employ in terms of deployment modes, I think over time just the sheer numbers makes render safe hard. But in terms of negative security assistance, the argument has always been that because they're worried about render safe, they're worried about any negative control technology having kill switches on their on their nuclear assets. So there's no way that you know they would allow the United States to have design level data for more advanced PALs, and uh, so it becomes very complicated. The countries that you need to assist the most are the least likely to accept it. Uh, and I don't know, but it, you know there are at least reports that the United States has done. You know there there's congressional legislation that prevents a certain amount of assistance to certain types of states, but you know the there's a certain amount of negative guidance that can be provided with certain classes of states. But in the Pakistani case, I think it would be very unlikely that we could and that they would accept significant negative control assistance. And you know, the Indian case, I don't know. I mean, this is something that the, I don't think we know a lot about in the open source. You want to run traffic? Would you care to comment on how this theory might apply to uh Say Iran and sure. Korea. Uh, that's a good question. I actually have an article coming out in three weeks in the Washington Quarterly, precisely applying this theory to those two countries. Yeah. So, you know, this is it, uh, this is. I'm sure this is going to get win me a lot of friends in Washington. But the the theory suggests, okay, North Korea, if it's you know, and there's some evidence to suggest that it's actually adopted a catalytic strategy with China as the envisioned patron state. Uh, you know, China doesn't want North Korea to. China gets a, it, it's this weird relationship that China and North Korea have, where China can't afford to cut North Korea loose, but it can also not afford it to be an overt nuclear state. And so it wants to keep the North Korean nuclear program in a box. And if we, you see some of the, the dynamics between China and North Korea, it's very similar to the United States and Pakistan in the 1980s, uh, or the United States and South Africa in the 1980s, where uh, the United States did not want these countries to go nuclear. And it was that threat that made those countries relevant to US foreign, you know, US foreign policy and why the US had to potentially think about assisting them in a crisis. And I think there's 
strong circumstantial evidence. I mean, anybody who says they know what North Korea is doing is lying. I don't think we have any idea how they're thinking about nuclear strategy because they haven't, you know, you would think that given the conventional force imbalance they face in South, you know, on the South Korean border, asymmetric escalation is their only option. But they don't have the forces, the capabilities, and, you know, certainly command and control structure to do that. The overwhelming nuclear and conventional superiority that would be brought to bear against them would be suicidal. If they have this option of a catalytic strategy, I think it would be optimal for them. And so that's what I, I would think that they would try to envision. Uh, and there's some evidence suggests that the Chinese and North Koreans are behaving like that. In Iran, uh, the two things. One, I think the if whatever happens, if the if they were to have uh, if if we could if they were to think about nuclear strategy, their security security environment, regional security environment has improved in the last decade. Uh, I I think sorry, yeah. So their primary bordering adversary, Iraq. Gone, right? So you're not worried about a convention. You're not worried about 1980 again, right? Uh, and you're not worried about U.S. invasion anymore, right? We're not parked in Afghanistan and Iraq. And you know, in 2003, I would have worried if I were if I were in Tehran, I'm going to be crushed like a walnut, right? I don't have to worry about that anymore. So my regional security environment today looks a lot better than it has probably ever looked. And uh, I might have a preference for assertive civil-military relations. So I think the model is, is Iran, a nuclear Iran look like Pakistan or India? And I think my theory would suggest that because of the way even IRGC uh, theocratic relations work in Iran, it's assertive enough that I might prefer assured retaliation to asymmetric S. What mission would, you know, I'm not Pakistan where I have a bordering conventionally superior threat anymore. So what mission do I really need tactical nuclear weapons for to threaten first use? And what um, uh, would I in invest in that given the complications of command and control it would entail when all I need is an assured retaliation strategy? All I really need to do is deter you know, uh, you know, nuclear use or coercion against me. And I want to deter outright extinction as a regime. And for that, assured retaliation is, is sufficient. Uh, and so the, the prediction I think, and I make, is it, it's gonna, it, a nuclear Iran would look more like India and less like Pakistan. And uh, you know, that, that is controversial, but it, it does turn on your interpretation of party, or sorry, uh, civil IRGC relations. And some of the evidence out there is not a lot publicly available. It's more delegative than the conventional structure, but not so delegative that I think the, the Theocracy would entrust tactical nuclear weapons to the IRGC for first use missions. So that's where I come down on that. So, Vivian, let me expand on that. When we're, when we're trying to assess Pakistan's choices and Iran's potential future choices, what role does subconventional conflict play in terms of the decisions right. that they make or right. that their, their targets, potentially of state sponsored terrorism, yep. might take in reaction? Do nuclear strategies trickle down, if you will? Uh to this type so I think of Pakistan is a really unique case because it's using subconventional sub attacks against the bordering state. Iran is not, right? So the kind of retaliation that it would face from, say, Israel is air, not ground. And so you know, first use missions against air power are difficult to envision and justify, and and not as uh, attractive as you know using them on ground concentrated ground forces. So I think Pakistan is sui generis in that way. I think Pakistan is is you know, and you, to replicate the Pakistani shield to unleash uh, uh, subconventional militants requires the target to be the bordering state. And that bordering state has to then have conventional superiority. So you want to use nuclear weapons to be able to, to blunt that conventional superiority. I don't think Iran finds itself in that. That's a very precise and unique security environment and, secure, and, and preference for use of uh, subconventional uh, organizations. And I don't think, I think Iran is, is different enough from that situation that assured retaliation may be more attractive just for, from the command and control advantages it, it provides. Questions? In the back? All right, so my question about you know, the implications of your framework for North Korea and Iran, that's already been asked. And you Addressed it, it, it uh, attracts. 
And I know you're focusing on regional nuclear powers, you know, relatively or newer nuclear powers. Um, but I'm also intrigued by how you think about Russia, how, how your framework applies to Russia, especially recent yeah. statements that we're getting about nuclear de-escalation. Right. Escalate to de-escalate, right? I, yeah. I think so. I conveniently punt on Russia because, you know, the, it's, it's, it has an architecture that's the legacy of the Cold War. So I say, ah, superpower. But the reliance on nuclear is much higher. So I actually, I mean, Russia is your classic asymmetric escalator. It believes it's now facing conventional superiority in Western Europe. Its conventional forces are decaying. It also, uh, you know, some of the doctrinal statements over the years have been somewhat troubling. I mean, the, the threat to use nuclear weapons against, you know, uh, separatist forces uh, and the, the concept of using nuclear, nuclear first use to de-escalate, right? It, it's, uh, it's actually very French in its, in its origin, but uh, the, those are troubling. And I think look, Russia probably does fit into, you know, it's a regional power now, but it has the, we have the misfortune of it having the legacy of the Cold War architecture. And so, you know, Russia really is in a unique position, but I do think that if it were to fit in this framework, it would certainly be asymmetric escalation. I mean, the Russians, uh, given the state of their conventional forces, have, uh, you know, really no option but to rely on increasingly on nuclear forces for their security. And um, I think conventional, the, the potential for conventional conflict escalating to nuclear, if it involves Russia, is, is very high. I think the two, the two nuclear states that worry me the most as, a, as an analyst are Russia and Pakistan. I think those two, for me, are the, you know, those are, those are the, the scary ones. So, so this line of reasoning begs the question uh, whether and how US policy choices might impact that decision tree for your theory about how regional powers might decide to evolve or change or right. retain their, right. their nuclear strategies. Yeah, so the, um, I think the two implications that are at the, at the end of the book, which is where all political scientists put their policy yeah. implications, Thanks right? Three yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Three. Uh, so the, I think the two implications are, you know, catalytic only works if, if you know, for a long time, if it was the US, but now maybe North Korea, China, um, if catalytic only works if the if the regional power believes that you're a reliable patron, right? And that's something that we can manipulate, right? We can say no, you're on your own. You want to start a conflict, you want to start a crisis. You know, we're not going to intervene on your behalf, right? On the other hand, maybe we prefer these states to maintain catalytic strategies, in which case we want to make ourselves available, right? So it our choices definitely can influence those those strategies, but that may entail our involvement in a lot of crises that we may not want to be involved in, right? Uh, and, you know, in the India-Pakistan case, I mean, do we really want to get involved in the, we just passed then Deputy National Security Advisor Bob Gates uh, in 1990 to the subcontinent, and, you know, the U.S. has been intimately involved in the de-escalation of crisis in South Asia. I don't think these conflicts de-escalate without U.S. intervention in those cases. Uh, but it's a, it's a policy question about, you know, on the one hand, you want to keep these states' nuclear weapons programs recessed, unambiguous, maybe not even operational, but that does mean more active involvement then, right? So retrenchment policies can have the effect of pushing states further along in their nuclear program. And then if their other option is asymmetric escalation, right? In the North Korean case, it is actually in our interest to have China play the patron role. Because if the other option is asymmetric escalation, if we think, if the North Koreans ever fear that they have been abandoned by the Chinese, then the North Korean strategy starts scaring us the way the Pakistani and Russian strategies do, right? So it is in our interest, I think, for the North Koreans to be reassured that the Chinese are a reliable patron and to encourage China to play that role. Because it is, in our, I think, in our interest for North Korea to keep its nuclear program limited. And you know, it can still then be a bargaining chip to roll back. But once, the, once they're convinced that China is not a reliable patron, then it's off to the races. And then rolling that back becomes a lot harder. And I think this is what we see with Pakistan. Other questions in the back? Oh, John. If you are a decision maker of a uh, thank God I'm not of a country <laughs> that has had uh, U.S. assurances of uh, uh, we'll take care of you, our nuclear umbrella covers you, and suddenly you wake up one morning and go, you know, I'm not so sure yeah, yeah, about yeah. the U.S. Yeah. 
and, uh, and, and your people are recommending perhaps we should go start a nuclear program. Yeah, I wonder who you're thinking of. Our own. I don't know who I'm yeah. thinking about, but uh, um, so what strategy then? You think they, uh, considering so, other neighbors of theirs who are also nuclear, what should they do? This gets. Uh, this is closely related to my second book project now that's ongoing, which is, you know, allies, formal allies of the United States that enjoy the nuclear umbrella, say in East Asia, um, that are island states, might uh, you know, want to go up to a point. So you, you, you hedge up to a point. One, it's insurance, if you ever fear abandonment. The second is it helps ensure, because you know that the U.S. doesn't want you to go nuclear, greater commitment on the alliance, right? So it serves a dual purpose. But if you do fear abandonment, right, at least in that particular case, you know, given that it is an island state, assured retaliation probably is the, the strategy that I think they would, uh, that, that would be adopted. And I think the, the gr one of the greatest non-proliferation successes has been the U.S. nuclear umbrella in a lot of ways, right? And so, the 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 trade-off that we always face is you want to you you need to reassure without reassure and deter without provoking the adversary, right? And so it's a it's a tight walk, and there's a lot of great work being done in uh, political science on this now. And uh, you know, but there there are implications that if 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 those states that currently enjoy an umbrella do decide to develop independent forces. You know, there, there are a couple, a couple options, right? There's a British option, which is you basically subjugate your force, right? And maybe that's what happens, right? And so it's a coordinated force. So it's independent in the sense that you have, you know, nominal independence, but all the development, all the, you know, even strategy coordination is with Washington. Or you go fully independent like France. Those are your two models, basically, right? And um, if you really fear abandonment, then you go the French model, right? But the difference is the French faced a ground convention. They fear an invasion and U.S. abdication uh, if, if the Warsaw Pact breached Western Europe. I think in the East Asian case, th there would be less fear of that. And it's also maritime, so uh, you wouldn't have to develop you know, necessarily a first use doctrine, but an assured retaliation strategy might make sense. Please join me in thanking Pippin Durant. Thank you, Thank you, a lot of fun.